do for BirdFest this year, um, you know, a lot of what folks wanted to hear about was, all right, how are Vermont birds doing in particular? And, um, and what's the status? What's going on in terms of research and conservation right here in the state? And uh, I thought, well, who better would it be to ask to invite to come and talk about that than, than Margaret with, um, with Audubon Vermont? So um, I, though I've just met Margaret, so I feel like I've been orbiting you for, for years, okay. admiring your work. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, Audubon Vermont is a um, really amazing friend of birds here in Vermont. Everything from common turn research to peregrine falcons to uh, Christmas bird counts to all the other things you're going to hear about today. And so we're really delighted to, to be able to partner with Audubon Vermont and with Margaret today to learn about our, our birds and conserving our birds here in Vermont. So with that, um, lackluster introduction. I turned over to a spectacular, the Margaret Fowles Detective. Thanks for coming inside on such a nice day. Um, so what I thought I would do, we do a lot of bird conservation work at Audubon, um, and I can't really talk about everything, but I'm going to highlight some of the work that I do. Um, some of it ranges from single species conservation efforts, endangered species, declining species, to kind of more habitat-focused work where we're working with forests and, and different age classes and grasslands and things like that. So that was my, I'm hoping that in the time that I have, I don't like rush through too much, but I want to be able to give you a sense of kind of the large range of things that we're doing in Vermont and how some of the species that we're working on are doing. Um, so I work for Audubon Vermont, which is it's a state office of the National Audubon Society. Um, so we're part of National. Um, we and because of that, we think we're thinking big. We're thinking about conservation on a large scale. So we're thinking about it in terms of migration routes, um, wintering grounds, and breeding grounds. And obviously in Vermont, we really focus on breeding grounds, but we're trying to put everything in the larger context. Of of some of the flyways, uh, especially here in Vermont, we're focused on the Atlantic Flyway and different groups of um, efforts that are categorized into working lands, um, coasts, which is really applicable in Vermont, um, bird friendly communities, when you're talking about homes and uh, urban areas and things like that. So we've got a number of focuses um, at National in Vermont as a piece of, of, has a piece of all of those focuses, except for really coasts. Um, so some of the critical species that I've been working on, um, I've been working on some of these for a really long time, and I've just started working on um, one. So I, since 1997, I've been working with um, peregrine falcon recovery, and that was before my time at Audubon. Um, and same with uh, bald eagles, and now we're just starting a chimney swift project, which is really exciting to see um, the chimney swift tower that's being decorated outside so that we can um, start putting one, or there, the plan is to put it out in the field and maybe attract chimney swifts to use um, this next season, next breeding season. So I thought I'd start by talking about some of these, these birds and what we've done in the past and where they are now, um, or where we think they're going. Um, starting with peregrines and eagles, I'm going to kind of do these at tandem because they're it's a very similar story. Um, peregrine falcons and eagles are they're both these sort of iconic species. They're um, successful reintroduction recovery stories um, throughout their range, not just in Vermont. Um, so in the case of peregrines, they were listed as endangered um, federally from 1970 to 1999. They were taken off the federal list in 1999, but we have them on our state list um, until 2005. So we had our own set of recovery goals that we wanted to meet. Um, we did a lot of work to meet those goals and now we're considering them to be a recovered species in the state. Although we still do a lot of monitoring um, and we still do a lot of protection of some of the nesting clips. Um, similarly for eagles, um, another great success story, they were listed as endangered federally until um, 
1995, but they got sort of this extra step of being taken down a notch of threatened status federally. So they weren't taken off the list until 2007. Um, and in the state here, they are still officially listed as a state uh, endangered species, but they have been proposed to be downlisted to threaten. So it has to go through a formal rulemaking process in the legislature. So I'm guessing that by the time that rulemaking process actually happens, that we may be at the point where we can take them off our state list. Um, so they're pretty close here in Vermont. We've got goals that we're trying to meet, and we're really close to meeting those. Um, so in both cases, these birds really declined in the middle of the 1900s, primarily due to the pesticide DDT, which caused them to lay eggs, eggs that had such thin shells that when they incubated those eggs, the eggs cracked and no young were hatched during that time. They're both listed right around the same time that the Endangered Species Act was passed, um, and both went through reintroduction efforts to bring them back. Um, so those efforts included what we call a process called hacking, which is putting them in their native habitat in an in a enclosure where they can imprint on their surroundings, let them um, learn how to fly and hunt on their own, uh, even works without adults around. And in both cases, that happened um, here in Vermont. So we think we had about 32 pairs of um, peregrines in the state of Vermont before the decline. Um, the reason why we have a pretty accurate uh, information on that is because there were egg collectors and falconers out there scaling the cliffs where the birds nest, um, collecting eggs, and documenting where they were. So we have great documentation. We know of about 60 cliffs that were used historically. Um, and so when it came time to be putting together this recovery efforts for this species, there's a lot of information about where they should be, and where they have been. And so three sites were chosen for the release of the captive raised birds. Those were, um, one was Marshfield, so not too far from here, Marshfield Mountain. Um, the other was White Rocks, which is down in Wallingford near Rutland. And the third one was Brandon Gap, Mount Ford. So those three sites is where they released young birds, and they did about 90 birds over the course of five or six years from uh, the early, early to mid 80s. Um, and during that time, the first pair started, came back to Vermont to set up a territory. Um, and that first site was in 1984 at Mount Pisgah, which is a historic site, huge cliff in uh, the Northeast Kingdom. And that pair raised young for the first time in 1985. So since then, we've seen this great long trajectory of increases to be at at least 56 pairs in the state right now. So we're above our historic levels. Um, they're breeding, they're still producing enough young to expand the population. We're finding them in places we would have never have expected it, like along a road cut or in a quarry. Um, on the Vermont Yankee smokestack. Um, so we're finding them in places where we wouldn't have predicted. Um, some of the sites where we knew they used to nest historically are no longer suitable, like forests have grown up and they're no longer exposed enough cliffs because that's their primary um, nesting habitat. Um, but so they're doing really well, but they're not doing well, uh, they're doing well with help. Um, and so um, we've now, we've moved from when I first started to do work on the project, we've moved from a time when we had a biologist or two really monitoring every site very closely, going out every week, determining what the birds were doing, if they were nesting, protecting those birds from disturbance, to um, really engaging communities in helping monitor this species. Uh, so this has become a huge community-oriented project. We now have got almost every site covered by volunteers um, who go out about once a month, but they can go as often as they want. Um, and they sit for, in the case of peregrines, it's a bit like watching paint dry. You sit and you monitor um, the activities of the birds for a period of time until you can determine what they're doing. So whether they're there, whether they're nesting, if they are nesting, whether um, that nest is successful, and then eventually um, counting the number of young that make it to fledgling age. Um, 
in addition to that, I do a lot of coordinating of the volunteers, but I also work a lot with the landowners and recreation groups, especially the rock climbing community, to uh, determine where on the cliff we can keep open for our climbing group, where it needs to be closed, what needs to be closed. It's an overlook. Um, birds are most uh, sensitive to people above them on the cliff or rock climbing like right near the nest site. So those are the two things that I tend to focus my efforts on now is really working with the people who either own or manage the cliffs to protect the birds. Um, and in doing that, I also do as much sort of outreach and education as I can. Um, so this is just a typical nest site. It's down on the Buckner Preserve in uh, West Haven. Pretty sheer cliff. Um, they always want a great view of their surroundings so that they tend to be in places where they, if they're out on the cliff, they can see pretty well because they're so territorial. They want to be able to chase off any intruder they, that they think of as an intruder. So it could be a vulture, it could be a hawk, a raven. Um, so that's kind of, and this, I don't have the 2019 data finalized yet, but um, this shows you the trend. So the perp, uh, I'll start with the red line. The red line is the number of pairs territorial pairs. Um, the, the green line is the number of nesting pairs, so there's always a few pairs that don't actually nest one year to the next. could be related to the fact that you've got a young pair, um, a new, new pair, new site, inexperience, something like that. And then the purple is the number of fledglings, which tends to fluctuate quite a bit um, because of some, there's so many factors that go into whether they're successful. If it's weather related, it could be predators. Yeah. What's the, uh, how, what's the nest success rate and what are perhaps the greatest causations of nest growth? Well, we don't really know the causations, but generally the nest success rate is about 75%, but we've had some years where it's been as low as 60-something percent and as high as almost 100%. So that's, it that's a very quiet. high rate, so they're yeah. very successful nests. Yeah. Yeah. If, if a nest fails, will they re-nest? They will if it fails early enough in the season. Okay. They incubate their eggs for about a month, and then it takes six weeks for the young to reach fledgling age. Mm -hmm. Once the other flying, it takes about a month for them to become independent. So they really don't have that much time. Mm -hmm. So if, they, if the nest fails within maybe the first couple weeks of incubation, they will mm -hmm. re-nest. I'm sorry, I said that was the last question. Are they, are, will, will nests be reused? Yes, so it's actually not a nest. Um, when I say nest, it's nest what side. you call it. It's usually a ledge on the cliff. Mm -hmm. They will steal a raven nest, so mm -hmm. they will use an old nest from some other species, but they don't actually build a nest mm -hmm. themselves. They find a little ledge, which hopefully has cover and protected from mm -hmm weather and predators and things like that. Um, and they'll scrape a little depression in the substrate on that ledge and then lay their eggs there. Thank you. Yeah. So as far as what, what causes failure, we don't monitor them closely enough to really know. It could be a predator, like a, a raccoon can scale the cliff. Um, it could be a raven. Um, it could be another, it could be human disturbance. It could be weather related. It could be you know, some nasty weather, like we had this spring. Some of the ha heavy downpours might have caused the nest to fail, whether because the eggs got drowned in the water or the chicks got hypothermic, something like that. Um, but in general, doing really well. We're kind of at the point now where we're determining where we go from here. Do we continue? It's such a great community project, and we've got so much engagement from the people who do the monitoring. There's no reason to stop monitoring those sites where we have people who are engaged. But we maybe there are some sites where we know it's really remote, it's never going to be disturbed, we can't find a volunteer to monitor, maybe we can just let those go and not count those sites every year. So we're sort of in the process of determining what's our minimum amount of monitoring that we want to do. It's really, you know, keeping the nest site protection piece as an important piece and then also um, keeping the community engagement piece important as well. So eagles, we're just sort of starting the process of engaging the community in a way that we did with peregrines, uh, which I can talk about a little bit more. We don't have great records on eagles. Uh, don't really know why this is. I think um, 
The only known record of a breeding pair is on Lake Bombazine, and that's from 1940s. Um, we know we have so much habitat here in the state that the assumption is, is that we must have had more than one pair of beetles at some time, um, but we just don't know. Um, and we were, Vermont was the last state in the lower 48 to get a pair, a pair of breeding eagles. We were sort of the last holdout. We don't really know why that is either, but eagles are slow to pioneer new areas. They tend to saturate an area before they move into a new one. Um, so we, we knew we had pairs in New Hampshire, we had them in New York, we had them in along the uh, Massachusetts Quabbin Reservoir, along the Connecticut River. Um, but we didn't have any come on. We knew it was going to happen. Um, we just didn't know when. And Senator Jeffords, when he was in office, really wanted to kind of do something for endangered species and wildlife. And he was able to allocate funding to do a release a hacking program, a release program. Um, and so when I was at National Wildlife Federation, we did that release program. We released 29 birds at Dead Creek. Um, kind of as a way to sort of boost the process, get these eagles here in Vermont so that we could say we had eagles. During that time, we got our first pair of eagles, but it didn't nest successfully until 2006. And now what we're seeing is kind of this exponential growth of pairs of eagles in the state. Don't really know if our, our relocation reintroduction project was what caused that to happen, but um, we went from one pair in 2003 to now this year, I think we have about 33 pairs. So again, very similar, and this is the first year where we brought community scientists in on a formal way to monitor eagles. Most of the effort has been in the Champlain Valley, um, just because the Connecticut River Valley has got a seasonal person who does the work for the state. Um, again, going out, finding nests, doesn't take as long as it does for peregrines to figure out what's going on. Um, documenting what's happening, whether the pair is there, whether they're using that nest, incubating, if young hatch, and if so, how many. Um, we also do a winter survey to kind of track where the important winter air, wintering areas are that volunteers help us with, and also general public. Like, you usually just put out a call for report your sightings during this period of time and try to track how many eagles are spending the winter here. And again, doing as much education as possible. With some of these species, like eagles and peregrines, it's really not hard to get people excited about them. They're, they're kind of charismatic megafauna. Um, so it's easy. People care about these birds. So, so yeah. Eagles over winter here. They do. They, they tend to congregate where there's open water. Um, so you'll see them at dams or along the lake, Lake Champlain, if there's unfrozen rivers. Um, they do feed, they're opportunistic feeders in the winter especially, so they will feed on a carcass, so people see them on the roadsides and things like that as well. Uh, but yeah, they do winter here. So um, this is our threshold for meeting down this thing. If, if we had to, we wanted to meet that threshold of nine pairs in the state over the course of five years, and as you can see, we've been above, the breeding pairs is the gray. Uh, we've been above that now for a number of years. Um, and this year will be a continuation of that. We also have goals for number of young produced per nest, which is one per nest, um, and we've been above that, too, um, for a number of years. So we definitely have met our goals for delist downlisting to threatened. Um, once we have the final numbers this year, we'll have to see if we're at the point where we can take them down to, or take them off the list as well. Um, but again, a great success story. They're becoming a sort of common bird now, which they never worked before. Um, so this is a, I'll just give you a quick overview. This is a new effort that um, we're doing with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. Vermont Fish and Wildlife supports our work with eagles and peregrines and terns, uh, common terns, which I don't do, so I didn't bring that one up, but, um, and now chimney swifts. So we're, chimneys are listed, swifts are listed as a species of special concern in the state. We know they're declining range-wide, um, and we know that people really care about chimney swifts. So the state wanted us to kind of get a sense of where they are, what parts, of, what urban areas they're using, where in those areas they're using for nesting and roosting. And um, 
So just this year, we started a kind of an effort to get people out looking for chimney swifts and documenting on eBird. So I put out, we put a call out, and uh, I think I got almost 400 reports. Some of those were repeat locations of, you know, I, there's a place in St. Johnsbury where I probably got 20 reports of the same location, but some, and that's, that's important too, to know that they're always there. Um, haven't analyzed the data, I'm now working with some new VM students who are gonna analyze it for me to figure out kind of where the key areas are. Um, and they're gonna also help me talk to people in Burlington about some of the towers or the, the chimneys that we know these birds are using and how they can be protected as well as doing what's happening here, which is really exciting, is building a chimney swift tower, which we know works to use, for chimney swifts to use a tower that's been put in a, an area. Um, they will use that for, for roosting and nesting. I don't really know. Uh, I guess you guys will have to document what the use is when you put yours out. Yeah, uh, we'll see. And I think we're a little late, but we're trying to find key roosting sites in Burlington, and we are going to have a night this week where we're going to go to the various parking garages, tops of the parking garages, and up by UVM, and do you scan the skies at dusk to see if we can see any chimneys um, Yeah. Is there any way we can know whether or not historically there were more when there used to be mature forests with more dead trees? I don't know. I mean, uh, these kids are going to help you do a lot of that research and figure out kind of the background. Because, um, yeah, historically these birds use snags and um, the forests for nesting, but they learned to use chimneys when the forests were cut down, and now the chimneys become an important part of their, their habitat. Um, okay, so I'll just shift gears a bit here and talk a little bit about kind of our habitat focused work. Um, so I work with two other biologists on staff, Mark Bavar and Steve Hagenbu. Um, Steve is kind of our forest guy expert, so I, I'm only going to be able to kind of brush over some of his stuff. And then Mark and I work on kind of the young forest early successional habitats, which includes grasslands and shrublands. So some of the, the icons of these areas for the shrublands, it's goldwing warbler, um, for the forest, scarlet tanager, and this is a uh, maple sugaring forest, which I'll talk about, and then the grasslands is the goblin. Um, so to start with, um, the forests that, or the grassland and shrubland work focuses mostly on the Champlain Valley where we're, golden winged warblers are only really breeding in the Champlain Valley and that's kind of our poster child of this work. Um, it's also just a place where we've got a lot of ag land that's been abandoned and is reverting back to forests and it's kind of in this transitional stage of shrubby habitat. Um, Grasslands are also most numerous in the Champlain Valley. So that's where we focused our efforts. And then Steve, his mature forest work, has been focusing all over the state, although we now have funding to help have him work with us in the Champlain Valley, where if, we find, if we're working with a landowner who's got all of those habitats, then Steve can come in and help us give recommendations for how you can manage your habitats um, in the in these different stages, how you can improve them for birds. Um, and um, so this project is really kind of a landowner engagement project. We're working with people who own land, um, in my case, mostly the Champlain Valley, and helping them uh, think about how to manage their land for birds. The Bobbling Project is kind of the name of the grassland work that we do. It's, it's a separate project, but it's all kind of part of a larger effort to work with grassland birds. Um, and it started initially as an economic experiment where to see if they could do, and I don't understand economics at all, but a reverse auction process where landowners or farmers could say, this is what I can afford to forego a, a, a hay cut or two. Um, and I, if you pay me this, I can do that. And so during that process, landowners and farmers have put in bids for what they can afford each year. And the, it's now housed by um, Mass Audubon. Mass Audubon determines what rate they can pay based on donations they've gotten from people. Um, and then a certain number of landowners are chosen every year to get receive the payment if they follow through. Um, so that's the nature of that. And what we tend to, and I go out and I count the bobolinks on the fields that have been enrolled. 
So there are two scenarios. One is where a farmer can, or a landowner can have the hay cut before May 31st, but then they need to wait 65 days in order to cut again. Um, that gives the birds enough time to come back into the fields, re-nest, and get young off. Um, or the other uh, option is to not cut the field until August 1. Unfortunately, what we're discovering with that second option is that a lot of the fields in the Champlain Valley are getting infested with invasive species, um, especially wild parsnip, which is just nasty and kind of nasty for everybody, but also makes the field unfriendly to farming. So we're trying to figure out now, maybe there's a limit as to how many years a field can get enrolled and do the delayed cut. Um, we're sort of working on that. And we're also trying to partner and get sort of the same message out and figure out ways to appreciate and recognize all the people who are doing this kind of effort for no money, because um, there are a lot of landowners out there who are delayed cutting, but not necessarily getting recognized or paid for doing that. Um, again, I don't have the 19 data, like this is the time of year when all those numbers are coming in, but you can see there's been a pretty, um, steady increase of numbers of acres protected in Vermont. Uh, most of the, even though Mass Audubon is doing this, or sort of managing this project, still most of the land enrolled every year is in Vermont. There's just a little bit of Massachusetts, a little bit of Connecticut, maybe one field in New Hampshire this year. Um, but it really seems to be a Vermont-centric uh, project right now. Is, the, is there a noticeable increase to the number of each species that you want. That's what's really hard to track. Mm -hmm. is, you know, we're seeing, we're, we can really only say that uh, the acres have increased. We count the bottle mm -hmm. lakes every year and we extrapolate how many young we think are produced. But we don't really know what that impact is on the population because there's so many other fields that aren't being tracked. We don't know how many are mm -hmm. being managed uh, in the bird zone. Could you select some control fields? And just so yeah, there are people you know. like UVM is doing a lot of work with grass and birds and studying all that. And I'm hoping that they're going to give us some information on um, how the population is doing. That's not going to be any to offer us today, though, on the number of fledglings that are coming. Um, I think every this These last ages. year was about 600 fledglings that we think got off. Um, six to seven hundred, and this year will probably be similar number, maybe. 600 or so. We had a few, a little bit of a dip in the number of acres enrolled this year. So I think, and, but the bottling numbers were similar. Uh, some of the fields that I've noticed is that some of the fields that are really great bottling fields are getting more birds and more concentrated birds from one year to the next. But then they're also getting, starting to see Parson Creek in. So in some ways, we're going to have to figure out how to keep that field of bottling mm -hmm. from them. It's getting complicated. It seemed like a really easy fix, not easy, but uh, straightforward <laughs> fix, and it's getting more and more complicated. Um, so the young forest shrubland work focuses really on these two species, but there are a number of other priority birds that we work with, um, golden-winged and blue-winged warblers. And these two hybridize with each other, so there's this whole range of Golden wing, blue wing, and everything in between in the state. Um, but it's some interesting info on the two species. One is that what we've seen is a decrease in golden wings in Vermont, um, and then generally decreases in golden wings in the north. Um, and blue wings, we're seeing increases in blue wings, and generally decreases in the south and increases in the north. Um, so we're seeing this kind of merging of the two in Vermont especially. Um, and we're really in the hotbed zone of hybridization of these two. Um, it's complicated because there's a lot of genetic information that we know and then there's some that we don't know. But in general, the theory is that this is pretty much the same species. There's only six loci on the genome that are different. And those loci are just based on plumage. Um, so based on what they look like rather than else. And so the fact that we're in this hybridization zone may just be that we're on a sort of timeline where the species have kind of diverged over time and come, come back together, diverge and come back together, and we're in that come back together time. Um, and we have a joke that we could put together a calendar of all the Vermont 
birds we've seen um, anywhere from one spectrum to the other and everything in between. We've had a different one uh, showing the hybrids. I've got a couple pictures of the named hybrids. So there's Lawrence's warbler and Brewster's warbler. So Lawrence's is really yellow like the blue wing, but he's got the chin marking that the uh, golden wing has. And then the Brewster's is really kind of like the golden wing, but doesn't have the deeper eye line or the chin marking. And the wing, bar and the wing markings are different. But because we have so many hybrids in Vermont, we see all different ranges of these colorations. Um, there is a group, that, a national group, that put together a conservation plan for golden wing warblers. Uh, it's called the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group. Um, and they, they chose some targeted areas to work in. Um, and our area here in Vermont, I'm sorry, I've dislocated my fingers. You can't use this one. But, uh, is really right here in the Champlain Valley. And what we've learned over time with all of our surveys and our work is that this, this area, which they call um, ME10, could be the whole valley. And so we're hoping that they're going to shift, expand that area of focus to the whole valley. Um, we've had a number of things we've done over the years, surveys. We've had a student work um, develop a model for us where the habitat is. Um, we've even done some geolocator work and we're discovering that they're all over the Champlain Valley. Um, not, we don't know so much about the northern part of the valley, but certainly from Burlington to West Even, they're, they're a lot more than we originally thought. Um, the Golden Wing Warbler Working Group thought we should aim for 20 pairs, and we know that we have at least 200 pairs in this area. Um, so this is kind of their typical habitat, and when I meet with a landowner, I ask them to um, manage if, if they're interested, if uh, I would ask them if they have this habitat, I would talk to them about how they could manage it because it's an ephemeral habitat, it's always going to change. How they could manage it to improve it or how they could manage it to set it back if it's starting to get a little too overgrown. So they tend to like this, what we call clumpy patches of, clumpy patches of um, shrubs like dogwoods or viburnums. Um, patches of herbaceous stuff, so that could be um, goldenrod or grasses, that type of thing. A few overstory trees. Um, and then they also want or seem to, to care about having forests next door to that habitat. Um, so in the case of someone who's maybe got a shrubby edge that's leading up to forests and it's infested with invasives, we might come in and ask and help them either find funding or um, give them guidance as to how they could manage in a way to improve the habitat. And they, most of the time, it's just telling, asking them to take the invasives out. To take the invasives out, you create that clumpy, op those openings and that clumpiness we're asking for. Um, invasive species are, you know, are not great. In the case of birds like the golden wing and some of the other birds we work with, they create the structure, but they don't have the same nutritious nutrient value that the native species have. So the host caterpillars or bugs that use a honeysuckle are more like junk food to a golden wing than uh, a dogwood. So taking those invasives out tends to really help us get that uh, work done. And we, we often work with Vermont Fish and Wildlife and NRCS, Natural Resources Conservation Service, to secure funding to make that happen. Um, and then afterwards, we'll um, go back in, and this is just a year of regrowth. It comes back really fast, looking great, and almost within a year, every time, there is one of these birds there. Um, here's one of the weird hybrids, so it's kind of a, I don't know what we call it, Lawrence's without the, without the black chin, or a blue wing with a big, wide eye stripe. Um, some of the other birds that benefit and animals that benefit from this habitat work are woodcock, um, prairie warbler, towhee, field sparrow, thrasher, and then there's plenty of mammals and plenty of other game species too, like grouse and turkey um, that benefit. So if the landowner's really interested in hunting, that might be a hook for, for getting him to, or her to manage her property for some of these things. So what Steve does with the mature forest is very similar. He works, talks with landowners who have mature forests on their property. 
um, and talks about how they could improve the diversity of birds on their land as well um, in a very similar way. He's, uh, if, if a property has a current use or a forest management plan, he might recommend certain activities that would increase the diversity of the structure for the forest um, in a way to benefit birds. Um, so here's a site where they're just not making like huge clear cuts or huge patch cuts. They're really doing selective cutting in a way that increases the diversity of the birds. Uh, another aspect of forest work that he does is work with maple producers. So he's got a number of people who um, agree to manage their maple forests in a similar way, where there's a lot of structural diversity in the trees, um, not just maples. Um, and and uh, if they agree to do that, they get a sticker on their syrup that says it's produced in bird-friendly habitats. And we, what we're finding is that people are starting to buy that syrup that's produced in bird-friendly habitats. And there are other states now looking into it. Yeah. And Green Mountain Audubon um, Center is uh, the model. That's right. That. The model. Right. We do have demonstration sites for both the syrup production and and just forest management. And so you can go and. Um, look at how we've managed the forest on that site for that. Thanks for pointing that out. Um, so this is becoming something that's going to really be, uh, could expand in a major way. Um, and we've now got Vermont Center for Eco Studies actually studying the kind of bird impacts of some of this management so that we can really uh, hopefully get to a point where people can get certified or some kind of real um, stamp of approval. Um, just an example of some people, if they, if they agree to do it, they also get a nice metal thing that they can put on their sugar shack. Um, and then one last thing I thought I'd just kind of touch on was um, work we're doing in communities, because some, I know a lot of, not everybody has a big forest or a big shrubland or grassland. Um, so we're doing a lot of work in communities where people can just work in their backyards or in their neighborhoods to um, plant native plants that attract birds and help birds in urban and suburban areas. Um, so this is actually a named national project. It's called Plants for Birds. Um, and the basic premise is to um, plant native species, not invasives. Um, and attract insects and birds and everything um, that can use your backyard. Um, think about insects, you can think about berries and fruit, you can think about nectar, um, nuts and seeds, and so it kind of covers pollinators as well as birds. Um, and you can actually go on Audubon's website, plug in where you live and come out, and it'll feed out a list of plants that are good for you, your yard. Um, So just quickly, you know, a couple things that I, people can do. Um, if you're interested and you have land that you want to manage, come talk to me or you can send um, us an email. Um, you can look at the Plants for Birds website to see uh, if, you wa if you want to. This is a great time of year to do plantings for birds. Um, go see a list of plants that you can try to find. Um, you can, if you're interested, join our list of community scientists, whether it's peregrine monitoring or eco monitoring. Um, one thing I didn't really talk about as a larger thing is just the whole concept of climate change and how that's really the biggest threat that birds are facing right now. So anything we can do to get our policymakers to do something for climate change um, is going to be key. And I'll take questions if, if there are any more, and I'm happy to talk to people after. Yeah. Oh yeah, sure. Yep. Thanks for. Thank you. Have you had any issues with uh, wind energy siting in Vermont with eagles or with other birds? Well, definitely. Yeah. Asked about it, but some of the sites are very close to um, peregrine yeah. sites. But um, is Audubon's an interface um, in, the, in the siting process in the state? Not really. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. We have a new director now who's much more policy focused and more. Cool. Like, 